Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stacey Stanislaw, and I'm the Communications and Events Manager for the Drexel Libraries. I want to thank you for joining us for this afternoon's webinar, which is called Saving the Internet, How to Use the Internet Archive, and is being presented by our digital archivist, Sarah Newhouse. Today's webinar is part of the library's new event series called Wednesdays at Noon, which brings together expert library staff and members of the Drexel community for weekly training sessions and discussions. We're hosting these sessions through the spring term, and we hope you'll join us for a future event. Just as a quick reminder, we are recording this session and all of the other sessions, so you can watch them again or watch any that you missed later on through the library's YouTube channel. That's it for me. Uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, who's going to talk about saving the internet. Thank you. Hey, Thank you. Um, all right, so th thanks for coming to this webinar about internet website preservation um, and specifically about using the Archive It tool, which is a part of the Internet Archive. I'm Sarah Newhouse. I'm the digital archivist in the Drexel University Archives. So today we're going to go over both how websites are saved from the ever-changing internet and also how you can find them once they are saved. Knowing how sites get preserved is useful because it's more complicated than you might think. And also because knowing how web crawling tools work will help you understand what you see when you look at them um, in Internet Archives. So I'm going to switch to my browser because we're going to do a little bit of a live demo here. Nope. There we go. So the website crawling and storage service that we use is called Archivit, which is a service provided by the Internet Archive, uh, which is a nonprofit dedicated to providing free online access to public domain, aka copyright free, materials including websites, games, books, movies, videos, um, et cetera. If you've never spent 15 minutes clicking around in the Internet Archive, I highly encourage you to do so especially their collection of games, which you can play in your browser. So a lot of old, great video games in there. Archivit is a service run by the Internet Archive that allows archivists to preserve or crawl uh, websites, save their content, and make that content available to the public. Here's how you look up old versions of websites in the Internet Archive's Wayback Machine, which is uh, what they call the public interface for their Internet Archives. To get to the Wayback Machine, you can go to the Internet Archive's main page, which is here at archive.org, or you can go to archive.org slash web, which takes you directly to the Wayback Machine. Once you're here, you type in a URL for a site you'd like to see. Let's, we're gonna do drexel.edu, um, and you click Browse History, or you hit Enter. And what you'll get is this beautiful histogram across the top, uh, which shows you all of the years in which a website was captured. And then below there's a calendar view showing you each day that a website was captured in that year. Just for demo purposes, I'm gonna scroll back to the first ever capture of Drexel's website in June, 1997. So once you find a date on which a website was captured, um, you will often get a timestamp showing you the exact time that it was captured. And if you click on that, uh, the snapshot will open up and you will be able to browse the website as though it was 1997 all over again. You can click on links, uh, you can navigate through menus. This will often take a little bit of time to load if it's image heavy. Um, sometimes it just takes a little bit of time to load. But you can find out, for example, what's hot in 1997 for Drexel University. So it may seem, looking at the, the Internet Archive, that it works by some kind of automated uh, robot or script that is just constantly crawling the web, looking for new websites and saving them. And that is 100% not true. There is no automated function out there just quietly saving things in the background and grabbing all the new stuff as it's created. If a web page ends up in the Internet Archive. It ends up here because someone like you or me pointed the Archive It tool at a website and said, here, go save this right now. So this explains why, let me jump back to the calendar view. Um, this explains why you may not find the site you're looking for in the Wayback Machine um, because no one thought to actually go and save it. And it also explains why there are going to be gaps in this calendar view because no one thought to go save it at that particular moment in time. 
So no one ran a crawl on the Drexel website between June and October of 1997, for example. So if you want to see content from August, you're out of luck because no one in August 1997 ran a crawl. When it comes to accessing the Drexel University websites that the Drexel University Archives preserves, there are three ways to do that. The first is what we just did through the Internet Archives main um, search interface through the Wayback Machine. A search will reveal all the times a site has been crawled, which includes crawls made by different people. So all of these crawls for uh, Drexel University websites were not all made by Drexel University Archives, particularly in 1997 before the archives was even crawling websites. Um, so I'm going to pick on pick one randomly here. Um, let's look at September 14th, 2011. Give it a second to open. Um, but you can always tell who has crawled a website when you're looking at a capture, there will be a button in the upper right that says about this capture. And if you click on that, you'll get information about who crawled it, when they crawled it, if it's part of an official archives or library collection, things like that. Um, I'm going to give this a second to load just so I can show you what that display looks like uh, when you're getting information about the kind of crawl that was run. But doing a search through the main Internet Archive is great because it aggregates everything that is captured using the Archive It tool, not just um, stuff that was captured by a particular institution or a particular person. So, yeah, so here there's this little about this capture button um, in the upper right. And if you click on that, this one was captured by us. OK, great. I just picked that randomly. Uh, this one was captured by Drexel University Archives, and it's in the Drexel University websites collection. So we also have our own um, portal or our own point of access for, uh, for materials that are just captured by the university archives. So this is a great place to go if you want to sort of look at Drexel's web history collectively, like you're just interested in Drexel. And the way you get to that is by going through the archives webpage, which is library.drexel.edu slash archives. There's a link on the left that says explore our collections. And this is where we keep links to all of our online materials, including our website archives. So the second link here uh, goes to our archive collection. Um, and that leads you to, do I already have it open? I do, that leads you to this page, which is the, the, the Archivit um, front end of our website collections. Um, and these are listed, I think in alphabetical order, they start with Africana studies, which makes me think yes. Um, and so you can just browse all of the uh, URLs that we have crawled. The other way to access our website collections is through the library's main catalog, which I hope most of you are familiar with. Um, this is the big search box on the library homepage. This is library.drexel.edu. Um, and there's a big white search box here that searches our catalog for all of the resources that we have available for students, faculty, and staff. So I'm going to do a search here uh, for COVID-19 because I know that's going to be a good search for websites. And once it loads, you will see we have an unmanageable number of results. So we have 7 million results. But um, on the left, you can filter your search by material type. And one of these material types is archived websites. There they are, there's 67 of them. So if you filter by archived websites, these are all of the websites we've collected through Archive It, through the Internet Archives harvesting tool. Opening one of these will give you a catalog record that has some descriptive information and metadata tells you what it's about. Um, and there's also a link to the archived website in the Wayback Machine. Um, and this one, oh, this is a good example because we only crawled this site once. We've only captured it once, but there are other captures here likely done by other people or institutions. So how do these websites get captured in the first place? Um, well, let's switch to talk about this away from, um, from the live demo and back into my slides to talk about how capturing sites actually works. <clears throat> so let's start by talking about how websites are organized, which is probably something a lot of you intuitively understand. Most sites are hierarchical in that they have a main page and then subpages that fall under that page um, in the directory structure. 
you can see this reflected in URLs. Uh, for example, with the library's website, we append things to the end of the URL. So archives and services both fall under the main library website. Um, and then these two subpages have their own subpages. This is all relevant because of how the Archivit tool captures websites. As I mentioned before, the process of capturing or preserving a website is called a crawl. Uh, and in order to crawl a website, you need a URL that will be the starting point for that crawl. Once you establish a starting point, you can also establish the scope of the crawl. So you can decide how far down this hierarchy you want the crawl to go. So you can run a crawl that captures everything downstream from your starting page um, like this. Or you can decide you don't need the top level page, you're really interested in something in the middle. Or you can decide you just want to capture a single page, nothing else in the hierarchy. Knowing where a crawl starts is important because this starting URL is what a catalog record is built around for public databases like Dragon Search um, or the public page for Drexel's website collections. So for example, if you're looking at our public um, website collections, uh, which again is linked from our website at our library.drexel.edu slash archives. If you're looking at this list of sites we crawl, you can tell we crawl almost 300 websites. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> but these, excuse me, these are just the starting point for our crawls. We're actually capturing way more URLs than this. We're not just capturing 300 URLs. Um, but the catalog records only get built for the starting point of the crawl. You can, um, so, well, so each of these pages could have, you know, 10, 20, 30 sub pages beneath them, and we are capturing all of those. They just don't show up in the catalog record. They will show up in searches if you search this page or if you search the Internet Archive, but they don't show up here and they don't show up in Dragon Search. So here's an example. If you were to scroll through this list of 299 URLs that we're capturing, it would look like we're not capturing the website of the newly formed Center for Black Culture. But we are. Uh, if you search for it, it does actually show up. We are capturing it. Um, but we're capturing it as part of a crawl that starts way higher in the hierarchy. This is actually coming in as part of our crawl of the drexel.edu domain. So you can see that that crawl captures pretty far down in the hierarchy. Um, but you wouldn't know we're capturing it if you were just looking, searching for it in Dragon Search or um, just looking at our list of websites. Another way that archivists can determine what gets captured in addition to working within a hierarchy is setting the scope of the crawl in terms of linked content. So think about how pages are connected by uh, not only hierarchy and directory structure, but also by links. If you're looking at, for example, this contact us or contact page um, from the library's website, you can see all of these links in blue and I circled them just because I thought the text was really small. When you're running a crawl, you can uh, capture content related to a web page by specifying that you want to capture everything linked from that web page. This is something that Archivit sometimes refers to as one jump away. So we could decide we want to capture everything on this page and everything one jump away, which would also capture the pages that live at these links. Uh, if we did that, all of these other pages would be captured in a crawl that starts at this URL. So it would start at library.drexel.edu slash contact, and it would include this, but also the home page and the library guides and the list of subject librarians and information about research support. Or sometimes you may want to capture only exactly what's on a single page. Uh, so no additional pages in the hierarchy, nothing that's linked from the page. Here in the Drexel archives, we do this for news articles that are written by Drexel faculty and staff or news articles about Drexel. In those cases, um, like this one, we don't wanna capture the entire WHYY website. It's not, it has nothing to do with Drexel history. Um, and there's a lot of stuff there that we just don't need and is likely being captured by other people. Um, so yeah, so we don't want the entire WHYY website. We don't want everything linked at all of these links. It has nothing to do with Drexel. We're not interested in it. So we would, we did run a crawl on this page um, that just captures the content of this article, nothing else. 
So how does all of this affect your ability to get to archived websites? Well, this information, I hope, helps you understand the limitations behind web crawling, which will also help you understand what you find when you are looking at preserved websites. So here are today's takeaways. Uh, one is just that a website gets preserved because a person has made the choice to preserve it. It isn't an automated process automatically saving everything, so you won't find archived versions of every single website ever made, only the ones that a person has chosen to save. And related, crawls only run at specific times, uh, also decided by human beings. So even if you find an archived version of a website, you may not find it from the exact date you're looking for because no one ran a crawl at that specific moment in time. And the last thing is just how a URL is crawled is going to affect how you see it in the Wayback Machine. So if you're clicking around in the Wayback Machine, looking at a capture of a site, and you find a link that doesn't work or some content that's missing, it's probably because the way the crawl was scoped or limitations of the archive it tool. If any of these seem a little disappointing because it seems like saving the internet is kind of haphazard and random, I have one last bit of good news for you. And it is that you too can help save the internet. So on the main page of the Wayback Machine, and again, this is archive.org slash web, there's a button in the bottom right that says save page now. If you put a URL in there, you don't have to log in, you don't have to be a member, you don't need a special tool. If you put a URL in here and click save page, the Internet Archive will crawl and harvest the exact URL that you put in there. So this is like the WHYY example I talked about earlier. It won't save anything else in the hierarchy, it won't save anything linked from the page, but it will grab the content at that exact URL. So this is a great tool if you're a researcher who works with information that's frequently changing, um, or if you want to pr preserve any kind of content that you think is at risk of disappearing. They also have a, um, a couple, a lot actually, of browser extensions that you can install into all of the major browsers that let you just click a button and um, save a website without having to go to this page first. So if this is something you're interested in doing, definitely encourage you to download one of those extensions. So um, that's my very broad overview of how the Internet Archive works. I should note there are other tools out there for preserving web content, uh, especially some that are dedicated to preserving social media and other kinds of um, dynamically generated content, as opposed to just static web pages. We don't use those in the university archives, but they do exist. So if that's something you're interested in, um, go, go find them. I'm happy to answer any questions about Archivit or about web archiving in general. Um, I hope you can ask, you will ask them in this webinar, or you can always email me later if you have questions about what the university archives is preserving, or especially if you run a Drexel related website and we are not capturing it, please let me know. We can only capture it if we know about it. So um, yeah, welcome questions by email. You can email me personally, or you can email the entire archive staff, which is three people. We're all very friendly. And your email is slightly more likely to get answered if you email the archives email address, just because three people check it every day. Uh, so yeah, um, thanks for coming. I think let's open the floor to questions. You can unmute yourself and ask, or you can type it into the chat. That's a great question. Um, I am saying crawl, but I'm going to type it into the chat. This is a regional accent problem that I've never managed to shake. Sorry. I have the same problem with Paul and Paul. So this is Stacy. I had a quick no, kind of silly question if yeah. nobody has anything right now. Um, just in your time working for the University Archives or just in your time as an archivist, have you found any particularly, I don't know, interesting or cool? Do you have a favorite um, archived website is maybe what I'm, I'm asking. Um, you know, I don't have a favorite see that Drexel page. archived. I mean, 
the the mid '90s were just a amazing time for the internet. Um, it was just a yes. group of beautiful weirdos all making their own weird stuff. Um, and the one of the places that was reflected was in GeoCities websites. Um, if you remember GeoCities, uh, everyone could have a page. Yes. It was free. Um, you know, lots of animated gifs and uh, um, what's the word? Uh, frames. Lots of websites with frames. Mm-hmm. Um, and when Yahoo announced they were pulling the plug on GeoCities, there was this rush of like activist renegade archivists working to save the GeoCities content. And as a result, a lot of that content is now in the Internet Archive. So all of these individual people's web pages, you know, dedicated to their dogs or, um, you know, information about their weird hobbies or their, you know, lots of uh, early like fandom web pages. So you know, web pages about uh, shows that were popular in the 90s have been saved now because this group of archivists and internet activists got together and just like grassroots from the ground up started trying to save things and organize their own effort. Um, you can read about it. It's a fascinating story. And there was a, there's a podcast, there's an episode of, I think it's 99% Invisible, the podcast, there's an episode about GeoCities that's great and about the effort to save it. Um, so those are fantastic. I love looking at those. They remind me a lot of, of being a teenager on the internet in the 90s. Awesome. Thank you. I think that's, that's exactly what I wanted. How can I rel- relive being a teenager in the 90s and all mm-hmm. of the, the early internet stuff? Yeah, so good good. Good. Um, Alexis has a great question in the chat that I'm going to read out loud. Um, it's, do you think we should encourage other people to participate in archiving the internet? Since things from the internet never truly disappear, are there ways to find things that haven't been archived? Um, I would absolutely encourage everyone to help save the internet, um, especially since the internet archive makes it so easy. Um, but things are definitely getting lost all the time. Um, if something is gone from the internet, it would have to live on someone's private server or someone's private storage, and you would need to personally know them, um, or they would need to put it online in some other way and make it discoverable for you to get it. Uh, there's already a problem with this in academia with what's called bit rot, um, or not bit rot, um, link rot, sorry, bit rot's a different thing that I have to deal with. Um, different part of digital archives. Uh, link rot, where academics publish papers, and then in the footnotes, they include links to their resources. and six months, a year, five years later, those links are gone. So it's hard to trace sources and it's hard for scholars to actually, um, yeah, just verify each other's sources and to do the same research again. It's hard to track down someone's research if that URL doesn't work anymore. So this is why I think the Internet Archive is is actually a pretty valuable service. Um, and why I encourage people to, to use it for their own ends. If you think you're going to need something in your research um, that is likely to disappear, go save it, add it to the Internet Archive. Because a lot of stuff just truly is gone forever. There's, there's actually a lot of um, kind of sensational, but also definitely uh, should be taken seriously research about the um, digital dark age that's coming where we just generate so much content right now that it's impossible to save all of it. And so future historians are going to not have access to everybody's Facebook page. Like TikTok is probably going to be mostly gone. Um, Instagram profiles, probably not going to be saved en masse. Uh, so there's a lot of, of hand wringing, some of it justified, about how future historians are going to find it impossible to do research about this period in time because so much stuff is disappearing so fast. And just because I want to make sure I mention it, you have to balance that with uh, concerns for people's privacy and sort of the right to be forgotten. Um, and the fact that maybe you don't want uh, like embarrassing things that you wrote when you were 12 to be on the internet, um, or you know, maybe you don't want your you know, private profiles to be on the internet. Um, and so you have to balance the desire to save things with the desire to respect people's privacy. Um, and that's something professional archivists re- wrestle with all the time. Uh, how does Internet Archive handle copyright and so on? That is actually a great question um, in the chat that I do not completely know the answer to. Uh, I'm sure they have a statement on it. The, um, the, my, my gut instinct is just that if things are published, it's fair game to save them. 
Um, it's not fair game to publish them and charge money for it, which is one of the reasons I mean, the Internet Archive is free. So they're not making money off of people's content. And for better or for worse, most of copyright law is motivated by um, profit and concerns around whether or not reusing something cuts into the profit of the original item's creator. Um, but copyright and, and web resources is super complicated and we are still seeing the legal cases that are going to have repercussions for, for decades. I wish I had a better answer for that, but it's a really complicated issue. I will say, I believe there have been cases of people wanting content taken down from the Internet Archive because they think it violates their copyright or um, because of privacy concerns. So you can absolutely look into that. The, the right to be forgotten is a, good, uh, is a good keyword to search for if you're interested in things like this. Yes, I, I am personally interested of uh, these questions. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, another th question, I, I was just mm -hmm. going to type all the time, but another thing I, I appreciated uh, and liked a lot in your presentation was how the, your uh, university's library have the links that show archived websites. Mm -hmm. Is that, that that is uh, some... Um, uh, how, how it's some things that you yourselves implement implemented already. Yeah, that's um, so that is something uh, that I just implemented last month that I'm really proud of. So I'm glad you like it. Um, that's an import from archive it into our library catalog. Um, that's something that we set up uh, specifically to increase access to our website archives so that those search results turn up along with search results for books, journals, you know, the, the typical things you'd think of a library having. Right, and is it automated or is something that yes. you guys, right? Um, I mean, it's, it's automated. So we had to set up the pipeline basically between archive and the catalog. Um, but now that that pipeline is set up, the, the import runs once a month. Nice. So you'll Weird. get more up-to-date results if you go directly to the internet archive, but you'll use, we'll still get results in our library catalog. Yeah, I, I love that. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, we're at 12.30, so we should probably wrap it up, but um, please do email me with any questions about this. Thank you much, so much, Sarah, and thanks everybody for joining us today. This was a great session.